All right, everyone, we have a few more uh, people coming in, but in the interest of time, we are gonna go ahead and get started. So first, thank you for being here. My name is Nikki Magruder. I'm the director of the Inclusive Impact Institute right here in uh, Columbia, Missouri. Um, so the nature of what I do is all things diversity, inclusion, and equity. I partner closely with the City of Columbia, who um, are our corporate partners. So um, we're out in the community doing things like the journey toward inclusive excellence, if you've heard of that before, um, and just doing everything within our power to make our community more inclusive. Now I say all that to say first, first let me say we're making a lot of strides in the right direction. We have to celebrate our wins, but that does not mean that we are without work to do. So this is a conversation that, um, you know, we need. We welcome the community and our officers um, to come together to start having dialogue that we can move forward with, forward with intention. So again, welcome. I want to jump right in with the why are we here. So everyone comes with an agenda or things that they want to accomplish um, in a meeting such as this. And we recognize and understand that. What I'm going to say to you is that because we have different views and different ways of, of seeing things, we have to kind of set the tone, if you will, for how this meeting will run. So let me first say, all agendas aside, we're desiring to make some progress in, in this room this evening, okay? So I have to say, without apology, that because we have different viewpoints, we're still going to handle each other with care. And the minute it gets disrespectful and you start to see me pack things up, we're done. So let's not go there, okay? Because we're friends, right? No? <laughs> At least, there's yes. somebody like yes. me. <laughs> okay. All right. So everyone has different motivations. There are different reasons why we're in this room today. So the citizen perspective, um, we all know this is not, I'm going to be very candid this evening if that's okay. Is that okay? Yes, sir. There's a perspective that we have, uh, many have as citizens, about police and their role in the community. There are perspectives that our officer have, officers have about what their job is, how they're going to do their job, and how they handle the relationships with the community. There's different ways that we're doing things. There's a lot of distrust, if we're being candid. There's a lot of fear. Um, and there's a lot of animosity. There's a lot of different feelings that are going on. The goal this evening is to start a conversation where we can work through all of that. So when we have all of these in a highly emotional, highly charged conversation, and this isn't just local to us, we all realize that. Like these conversations are difficult across the country. But we're talking about our, our home right now and how do we move forward. So with that, when there's already a sense of fear, maybe distrust, maybe animosity, maybe they don't understand us, we don't understand them, then we have to figure out how to communicate with one another in a way that's culturally competent, culturally sensitive, that takes into account that each and every one of us in this community brings something different to the table. And if it's within our power not to move things or do anything or say anything that is unnecessary, um, that can further hurt the relationship that exists, then we should be intentional about doing that. I'm proud of where our community is moving toward. I'm proud that we're in a room like this today where we have made a decision, a conscious decision, that we're gonna have a conversation and we're gonna work toward being able to hold each other accountable in a way that really moves things forward in the right, in the right way. But when we already have a relationship that is fractured, there are things that happen that um, further hurt the relationship. So we brought you to, here this evening because there are a couple of organizations that I want to recognize um, that approach the city. And can I just um, point out our interim city manager um, that is doing a, an outstanding job of trying to move things forward in the best way possible. So Coma for Progress, I believe, Race Matters Friends reached out and said, hey, we want to have this conversation. Um, can you help us organize this? 
Um, and I appreciate leadership that doesn't back away from issues, but says, okay, let's figure this out. So that's how we got here this evening. So thank you to Rebecca, thank you to Tracy and Ray Center's friends, um, Coma for Progress, thank you for everyone for being in the room and making this happen. So what initially um, led to the reach out, if you will, were, was the conversation around communication and how communication can, can take things in left field when we don't consider um, the members of our community. So one of the things that came up was about social media posts. So let me first say, if anybody knows a John Jurgens, this is not him, okay? Let me be clear about that. John as in John Doe, Jurgens as I was looking at my lotion bottle, okay? And I figured that would be a good name for this fictional character. So I want to mention John Jurgens. So let's look at him because we want to start this conversation talking about communication and the importance of how we're seen and heard in our community. So John Jurgens is looking at, has made this Facebook post. 15 hours ago, John is, and everyone, if you can't see from in the back of the room, it's a picture of Bree Newsom taking down the Confederate flag in Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina, the Carolinas. <laughs> I was gonna make that shit. Right. <laughs> so John, just regular old John, no Jurgens lotion, said, talk about deplorable. It would have been my pleasure to get her down from that flagpole. This flag is important to our nation and our history. There are many that are going to agree with John. So far, I already ate people. And John should be able to say exactly what he wants to say because we are in a country where you can do that. We have freedom of speech, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. So we should be able to say exactly what we want to say. So he doesn't identify himself. He's just, you know, laid back, looking at the sunset, maybe, um, in, um, in his profile picture. John's not hurting anyone. He's expressing his opinion. However, we know, because we're in a small enough community, we know that John Jurgens holds a very public position. So then you look at John Jurgens through that lens of, wow, but you have taken this oath to do this job, you're public facing, you're dealing with all different individuals in the community. So now I'm looking at what John Jurgens is saying in a different way, because is he considering everyone? So personally, let me just share. I have, for four and a half years, I've been able to work in this community doing diversity and inclusion work. It used to be, and I've always been kind of scary, I wasn't really social media savvy, never. Um, but I would say what was on my mind, um, never anything outrageous, because that's just not me. But I remember having a conversation with my executive director at one point where I was saying, well, I want to go to this meeting, or I want to do this, and I wanted, and I wanted to share this story because I was just really upset. And she made it clear to me that even though you want to go or you want to do this as Nikki Magruder, you are no longer just Nikki Magruder. You're in a public facing position, so you're Nikki Magruder at the time, regional manager of the Diversity Awareness Partnership. You are in a community where you're, you have to pre present yourself as a resource for everyone, even those whose views I don't agree with or they don't agree with me. I still need to be able to be in a position where they are able to come to me and say, hey, can you, can we talk about this? Or hey, can you come and do this training? Hey, can you meet us here and talk about this topic? But if I exclude myself, even though it's personally, I'm at home, this is, I have a glass of wine over here. This is me, I'm personal. I'm in my pajamas. <laughs> I'm on my own time, right? I'm not in my snazzy yellow blazer. I'm just comfortable. But I don't have the luxury of just being Nikki Magruder Anonymous when my job requires that I have the faith and trust of my community, each and every one of them. So I tell people often, I go um, biblical for a little bit, so just go with me, just bear with me for a second. Because to whom much is given, much is required. So if we take on the role to be in this public facing position, we now have the responsibility to do better. And that's just facts. So I don't 
don't want to ostracize, especially when we're in fractured, a situation where there's fractured relationships. I never want to put myself in a place where I ostracize someone who may need to have a relationship with me mm -hmm. later on. I want them to be able to come to me whenever. I want to be able to go to them. Does that make sense? So I wanted to spend some time on the front end just talking about that because also what I've learned in this position of diversity and inclusion and equity is um, cultural competence and sensitivity is important for me as well. So I can't say um, just anything I want to say or, or say, well, I just didn't know because I'm taking on this public position and I have to be more cognizant and aware. I remember I used to celebrate Cinco de Mayo in a different way, just to give you an example. But when you say, wait a minute, I want to learn, I want to do better, then no, do not, we're not doing it that way. That's culturally insensitive. And I'm not saying these things because it's culturally insensitive and we have to do better because I'm in a public facing role and I want to make sure I don't dehumanize or ostracize any of my community members. So I say that for our public facing positions, but it really goes for anyone. So I also say to people all the time, just to spend just a few minutes on, on media. Bye media. <laughs> Hope you got my good side. Um, I, I say often, you know, it's important. Um, social media is, is social, right? It's not private. Sometimes when I've seen something or heard something, something that's going on in my community, I can't be on social media. This is something I have a 10 and six year old at home. I'm trying to teach them before they even think about a Facebook account, right? It's like not everything is for the public. Sometimes we have to develop ways, and this is just a little, this is a freebie right here. Sometimes we have to develop ways to get our emotions out in a way that not everyone needs to see it. So I have a group of people that I work with. We're in a group chat, and every once in a while, I just feel like, can you believe? And it's a safe place, and they're like, well, did you look at it this way? Did you consider this? But I'm safe in my circle, and it's not out there for everyone to see, and they can either hold me accountable or make me feel validated in my feelings for that five minutes, and then get over it. So we have to just think about things and be more cognizant and aware of how we're dealing with the public. So again, why are we here? So I want you to consider this. Finding common ground is hard, would you agree? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're coming from different sides of, a, of an issue or a concern. Finding common ground is, is difficult a lot of times. Especially if you've done some of the pre-work. Did everyone have a little sheet when you first came in? And did you start to think about some of those things, like the conversations that we're having about police, as police officers, the conversations that we're having about our jobs? The thinking of how, when did I start to develop my um, views on the roles of police officers? And it hit home for me. My daughter was probably six, my 10 year old was six, so about four years ago, I was just starting to do this work. And I remember we were um, going down the street at one point, and my daughter said something about seeing a police officer, and she made a statement in fear. And I had to think about what I was saying. And then I thought it happened to me too. When your parents would be like, you better put that seatbelt on. You see that police officer, do you want us all to go to jail? They're gonna come and arrest you. They're gonna put you in jail. And we incite the fear in our children. Have you thought about that? So when you think about those questions, that's one of the things that I thought about. Now, how are we having these conversations? How are we developing healthy thoughts about um, who they, who police are? As community members, what is our role in the things that we're saying? As police officers, what is our role in the conversations that we're having about what we're doing out in the streets every day? So if we spend some time just looking at um, those ideals that have been formed, we have to realize and remember um, that we got here a certain, uh, and not by intention, like our lived experiences over the course of time has got us here. And we don't always agree. It's hard to find common ground. It's hard to have these conversations, much less work together, especially on the side of this issue. So let me be real honest with you. 
in the work that I've been able to do, and I always have over the course of my career been able to do a little bit in diversity and inclusion work, but since doing it full time almost five years, the conversations I try to avoid most often are with, are with police officers around this issue. I'm being transparent and with the church, with interfaith communities, because everyone is so steadfast in their beliefs and their views, and oftentimes it's hard for them to do a paradigm shift and look at it from a different perspective. And because I and, the, and how I do this work, and I tell people all the time, it's more like ministry for me. And that means different things to different people. But for me, you know, I feel uh, like I'm in this position for a reason. And so I'm not gonna be the girl to do the, the work a la carte. So you're never gonna be able to say to me, well, you can come and talk to my officers or you can come and talk to my congregation, but don't say this and don't talk about that topic because I'm not the one for you. When we have these conversations, we're gonna put it all on the table and we're gonna have real, open, honest conversations so that we can get to the root of the issue. And that's what I hope for us this evening, that we can get to the root of the issue. And that we can start having more conversations like these before a crisis begins. Because everybody wants to talk in crisis mode. Like, what can we do? Oh my gosh, can you come and help us? This just happened. We wanna make sure that we get this, um, this population over here and this population over there to come and have these conversations. We have to put ourselves in a position where we're not always reactive um, when a crisis has happened and we're being more proactive about building healthy relationships. So in today's discussion, we have some ground rules. So I used to hate in college when my professor would read them to me, but I do wanna emphasize a few things. We are gonna listen to each other with respect this morning. We want each person to have an opportunity to speak. We want each person to have an opportunity to speak one at a time without interruption for others. And we're going to speak for ourselves. None of us in this room can represent anyone other than ourselves. I, as a woman of color, cannot represent all other women of color. But I can tell you my personal experience and talk about it from that perspective. So we're just going to speak for ourselves. If something that is said hurts or bothers you, say so. This is the room that we're saying so. And knowing that it's okay to disagree, but as I already said, if I'm packing up, it's because disrespect is going on, and we're not going to do that this evening. Does anyone feel that there are some ground rules that we need to put up here that are not there? Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. Can we make sure all the communities in Columbia will have a chance to, to speak? Um, this is, there are, there's the west, and there's the north, and there's the east, and there may not be as many people representing certain parts of the community, uh, but I just feel like sometimes all parts of the community in Columbia are not heard because they're not here. But some of us from those communities are here. And we do know a lot. And we go out in our neighborhoods and talk to a lot of our neighbors and probably working right now. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I can speak for what's gonna happen in the two hours that we have on this night. And hopefully, you know, the community, the conversations will, will go on. Um, beyond just tonight, it's going to happen. We're not going to fall. Here's, a, here's something that I want to develop an expectation for and make sure I manage. We are not going to solve all of our problems tonight. As if everybody understands that, right? <laughs> there is no way we can solve. <laughs> we can solve it all in the two hours that have been allotted for us. Um, but hopefully, this is an opportunity to get the conversation started, not just here in Central Columbia, but but everywhere. So this, as we're having conversations tonight, so we have you in these pods for a reason. Yes? I just want to add to your Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yes. Um, that we all assume good intent. Mm -hmm. And one that I say to my students all the time, this is the biggest one, practice courage. Mm -hmm. Courage Practice courage. courage. Which is take, take, a, take a chance outside of your comfort zone and your box just for this period of time and be willing to consider another opinion for at least five minutes. Actually, that was three, but go with it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Absolutely. And I'm going to put on my Brene Brown hat and say courage over comfort. So don't sit here thinking you're going to be comfortable. We have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable for a moment as we move through. All right. So 
this is what we're gonna we're in a, your pods for your tables for a reason because I wanted the bulk of this to not be me speaking at you. I can speak all night long. Let me tell you, I can. I'm good at it. Um, but that's not what we want to happen. If we're having a community conversation, then the community needs to have the conversation. So I have some things lined out for you to to talk this evening. But as we're doing that, I want you to think of this overarching, if you will, question and assume good intent. What is the best thing that we can do to strengthen relationships between community and law enforcement? That is our goal, right? So no matter what side of an issue that you sit on, no matter what prompted you to be here this evening, no matter what feelings that you have, whether it be um, uh, optimism or came here with um, a takedown agenda, whatever it was, we're going to pull all that aside because the goal should be how do we strengthen these relationships? This is important. Is that why everyone's here? I know the groups that um, spearheaded the effort to put this together have been very clear about the desire for a community policing model. So in that, we have to have relationship, right? We have to have a strong relationship between community and, and law enforcement officers. So with that, um, and all the things that have brought us here today, there's a couple of considerations I want you to think of. One, uh, race is going to come up. Say that to yourselves in your head, or you can say it out loud if you feel. Race is a thing, and it's going to come up. So I wanna preface that in the conversation is we're not shying away from that this evening. We're putting everything in the t on the table but we're gonna have a healthy conversation as healthy as possible around race and a plethora of other areas of concern. But it's important to call that out. It's going to come up, so let's just put it out there. Our lived experiences are the reasons why we view things a certain way, and I'll talk about that more in a second. We are all gonna bring different perspectives based on how we identify, based on our race, based, based on our social class, based on where we live in the community, based on our positions of power, we're all going to bring a different perspective to the table. And here's the thing, I kind of love that. It's called diversity, right? It's an aspect of diversity, and we're all bringing that here. All of our lived experiences and everything, um, everything that we bring to the table is here. So one thing I also want to share is as we're sharing within our groups, it's important, and Tracy will appreciate this, that we focus on, if we're telling a story, what people did, versus who we think they are. So we're not going across the table and it's saying, well, I think you're this, or I feel that you're that. We're not doing that this evening. But we can <coughs> focus on actions. So if something was said, let's focus on that. Because when we focus on who we think somebody is and we tell them that, then the conversation gets derailed and goes somewhere completely different. That was a transformative learning for me. <laughs> when I figured that out in my interactions, I used them with family, I used them with friends, I used them in the work. Let's focus on the actions. Okay, you're not this or that, I didn't call you that, but your actions, when you did this and when you say this, you have to understand this is why it's perceived a certain way. So we have to be clear that when we're telling our stories that that's where we're focusing, on the action. And then one of the bigger ones is the understanding that we all have implicit bias. Everyone understands that? None of us put on this powerful cape in the morning and then all of a sudden, woo -woo, I don't have any bias. It doesn't work that way. No one has any role in the community in life that says, because of this, I do not have implicit bias. It does not work that way. If you have a brain, you have a bias, period. Okay? So we have to get comfortable with that as well. And this is a sticking point for a lot of people because they don't want to be called or assumed to be anything. They don't want to be um, uh, afraid there or there's guilt or they don't want to be um, labeled. So it's a sticking point for a lot. But I like to bring it up and it's my favorite topic to talk about in this work because many people don't even realize that our lived experiences and how we've been socialized lead us to sitting here as adults and having bias, period. Even when we're good people, 
and we have people, other people to vouch for the fact that we're good people, we still have bias. So the communities we were born in, the families we were born in, the lived experiences that we had, that one time that Uncle Joe from across wherever came to visit and told that story that we overheard at dinner um, during the holiday and has, has, has planted a seed within us, the, the stories that we hear on the news, the stories we read in the paper, the books that we've read in school, the teachers that we've had, the places we've been through, literally everything that we live through contributes to our having a bias. There's no way to get around it. And a lot of these are unconscious. We don't even know that they exist because we haven't been intentional about uncovering what has been hidden. So when we're figuring it out, what those biases are, we bring the unknown to light, then we have a responsibility if that bias could be doing harm to another human being to mitigate it. So I spend a lot of time talking about implicit bias because I used to think way back when that as a woman of color, already coming from marginalized communities, I was without bias. Because how can I? Like I'm, but no, it doesn't work like that. Absolutely. And when I started to uncover it, because there's tools out there that you can use, um, one that's free and open to anyone, you can even do it on your phone, is the Harvard Implicit Association Test. Has anyone heard of that? You can take a Harvard IAT assessment. I always say start with the one that you don't think you have a problem with. <laughs> so as you're reading the different lists, because there are a ton of them, and you're looking, you're saying, oh, that couldn't be me. Yep, go ahead and take that one. Because you might be pleasantly surprised or not. I took it, was not surprised, took it three times trying to, to um, get to the result that I wanted to have. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have bias. And it's going to come out even as we're talking through our views and perspectives about different topics this evening. So we need to recognize and understand that and be comfortable with that uncomfortable reality today. Okay? And again, we're not going to solve everything in this two hours, but I wanted to talk through these things because, believe it or not, our biases, our unwillingness to um, see each other's perspective because we have our views that a lot of times are driven by our biases and our experiences, it's important to talk about those things in preparation for what I'm going to ask you to do this evening. So. We're not gonna be able to solve all of our problems this evening. In an ideal world, we'll have numerous conversations as what was already brought out. We'd be able to understand how we got to our views. We'd be able to get to know each other better. We'd be able to come up with action plans together. We'd be able to just hear each other's individual stories. You know, there's a lot of conversation that needs to take place. We're not gonna uncover all of that tonight. But tonight, what we are going to do is Look at what's happening between our law enforcement officers, who we need, by the way, we do, and our community members, who we need, by the way, we need each other. So in this evening, we're going to talk with one another, learn from one another, and figure out how can we strengthen our relationship. Are we ready to do that? Yes. So we're going to pass out a sheet so as Hunter is doing that, what you're going to do in your groups, we're going to have three rounds of talking about our views. So there should be enough sheets for everyone to have one. Um, if not, please share with your friends. But these views are different perspectives. So as she's passing them out, let me read them to you. Some people have the view that citizens and police do not understand each other that a police officer's freedom of speech should not be monitored when they are off duty, that the community does not give police enough support. We have the view that citizens and police are not doing enough to keep neighborhoods safe. We have a view that being tough on crime is good, but it leads to other problems. Some have the view that it is the community's job to hold police accountable. Some have the view that police officers should not have to bear the burden of being held responsible for the actions of officers who may think and act differently from them. Some people have the view that citizens are responsible for inciting police with their words and actions. There's eight different views here.
So in round one, we are going to think about the view of those eight that's closest to your own. So from that list, which view is closest to your own and why? And think about the beliefs or things you've experienced that have helped form your ideas. So how we do this is one, three, six, all. So for one minute, you're going to just think about your, which one is closest to you, read them silently. For the next three minutes, you're gonna find a partner, two people, two, one, two, find a buddy, okay? For three minutes, and you're gonna talk with your partner about the views and find out where there's commonalities and where there's difference, differences between the two of your views. Then for the next six minutes, you're gonna talk in your table about the commonalities and differences within your respective tables. And then we're gonna spend some time reporting out to, the, to all. What questions do you have about what we're gonna do first? Smart remarks, I'll take them off. <laughs> no? So we're ready to do, yes? Is there an openness to discussing the views that aren't on the list? That's round three, but thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the short answer is yes. That will come up. Are we ready? All right, so your one minute is starting now. Silent reflection for one minute. Just, just breaking the rules already. <laughs> so there's post-it notes on your tables. We might have to share with our friends in the back. But as we're sharing what your table's commonalities were, I want you to designate a scribe to put your commonalities on a post-it, put your um, differences on a post-it. And we're going to post them on flip chart one. OK? No, I'm sorry. We're going to post it on the flip chart in which it resides. So if it, whichever um, view it was. Does that make sense? Wait. No, don't It's not. Class, class. Yes, I will repeat. That's how you have it. Whichever, whichever view you're talking about, you have similarities or differences about a view. Can you hear a class clap? Well, you can hear if we're having side conversation. Okay. Okay. So whatever view. We have one, two, three, four based on each view of the sheet. Whichever one you're talk, you talked about in your group, or maybe there may be multiple. Uh, the similarities and differences you're coming up with on, on the post it post it to the recording view that you talked about. Do you see how the about. views are numbered here? Mm -hmm. One through eight. Yeah. yeah. Well, so if your major similarities were in view one, <laughs> you're putting your post-it and what was similar about it over here. Like we're just figuring that out. So we only get one post-it? No, nope, you should have a stack. Okay? All right. Is that clear as mud? Further clarity. So let's just start. Let's report out. Who wants to share which table, what, where you found your similarities? And then it'll flesh itself out. And that in the back we have. What can you share? Can you share it? Okay, we have a, a table up in the back that's going to share where they found their similarities and what maybe what stories you shared to come to that uh, determination. Uh, our primary was number three: the community does not give police enough support. We talked a lot about the um, lack of police Listen. in Columbia. Um, we also talked a lot about some of the things that we've read in the news about um, maybe lack of pay increases, um, things that I've known from talking to police officers that I've been here that, and I'm not gonna speak for police officers, I'm, I'm just saying that it seems to me that we need to put more funds and we need to put more of an effort in our community to support our police because they are working very hard and they have been given lots of different directives and lots of different things and obviously there's been a lot of change in management I'm putting that in quotes because I know that's not the right word 
But so that was the primary thing that we said. And then we also talked about citizens and police aren't doing enough to keep neighborhoods safe. I agree. So, uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. So are you moving towards your major differences? That was also one that we, we found talked similar. about both of them. So this table is number three and number five is where they found most more common ground and she explained the why. Three and four. Three and four. Yeah. Does anyone else want to share where they found the most common ground and how you came to that conclusion conclusion at your table? We didn't have enough time to go beyond superficiality. Besides what? We didn't go beyond superficiality. Oh, so you were talkative. Talkative over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else? We'll, we'll, we'll have some more time in just a moment. Yes. Yeah. So we actually found the most consensus agreement in ones that we disagreed with on the views. Okay. Um, we, we felt really strongly, all of us, that uh, view two, we did not agree with. Um, <coughs> so this group, just for everyone in the front, found that they, they all strongly disagreed with view two, which says police officers' freedom of speech should not be monitored when they are off duty. And now she's going to share with us why. <laughs> we, 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 in part because some of the discussion we had uh, revolved around the position the police officers hold in the community um, and sort of the power differential that there sometimes feels like there is. Um, and did you want to add to yes, that? No, yes. I, I just, I'm sorry, but I really did agree with that. I, no, that's I know. Right. You, you did, did agree. That you disagreed that oh, yeah, okay. Yes, you're on the same, you're on the same page. So they strongly disagree with you, too, because of the role that they have in the community. So Hunter is putting that up on you, too. Any other tables want to share whether you found con strong consensus or strong disagreement in which view that was? Uh, Actually, I don't know that we had a lot of time to talk about it, but I think that we all agreed um, at least at the surface level, that there are things that the community can do to improve it, and there are also things that, from the side of the police, and that at times the problem seems so big that both parties are just exhausted by it. Um, okay. Just kind of a mutual understanding that everyone kind of sees there's some problem, um, and everybody has a, a role to play in fixing it, but we kind of get overwhelmed and exhausted in figuring out what that is. What view is that? What view? What number is Yeah, view four. Sorry. Oh. Yes. And which you, Ashley, for everyone in the front? Four. Four. Any strong agreements on any views that your table came to consensus on? Yes. We, uh, we pretty much agreed on view one. Uh, citizens and police do not understand each other. Uh, we talked about that uh, both citizens and police should make attempts to understand one another to, you know, share experiences like she mentioned that we're citizens as well. We have family that are citizens that, you know, we might not know what it's like to be in that role and vice versa. Right. She mentioned she can't believe we worked in our ship. You know, she would never ten hour shift. Ten hour shift. Did everyone know that community? The shifts are ten hours. Okay. She couldn't imagine. She's done it. She wouldn't couldn't imagine how yeah, you can have that. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So view one. Right, so they strongly agree <coughs> that citizens and police did not understand each other. You had something in the back? We also talked about you one, and we just kind of talked about how it's hard with the limited amount, and you guys were reading the 10-hour shifts, to have just kind of neutral and positive everyday interactions with police officers, like particularly in our neighborhood. The police are in our neighborhood. They're there for a reason. They're trying. They're doing their best to keep us safe, but it's difficult for us to build and understand each other if all the interactions that we have are as a result of some kind of conflict or some kind of violent issue. Um, so it's hard to understand people if you don't have neutral and everyday interactions. So it goes back to building the relationship so we're not only talking with one another or trying to find some kind of common ground during crisis. Right, so how can we develop the the understanding and 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 get to know each other a little bit better? Which I think was the um, the driver for the community policing 
desire for, for much of the community. This is why we want to see this, um, because we want to be able to understand each other better. But yeah, that whole 10 hour thing, mm -hmm. yeah. didn't know. Nikki, um, I have to leave at seven, unfortunately. I just I promise to keep this short. We did okay. talk about view number one, about <laughs> not understanding each other. What I talked about first, I was one of the original appointees by the city council and the citizens police review board, okay. which is now 11 years old and doing almost nothing. Um, I'm not on it anymore, but um, I feel like it's almost been forgotten that that was set up by the city council with a lot of community consensus to bring people together. And I feel like it's been a pretty big failure. Um, Can you make a note about CPR? So I'm not going to say any more, but I just, I don't know if that'll come up later after I have to leave. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. I have a person. Uh, I'm out there on the key, and I talk to a lot of my neighbors out there. We're trying to figure out when is this shooting ever going to end? We're I don't getting, have We are getting so tired of it. Yeah. And so which view are we looking at? Is that the one? I don't think it's on there. Maybe four. Maybe view four. You find you find strongly feel strongly about keeping the neighborhood safe. Absolutely, Patrick. Well, I think five should be on here too somewhere. With the, the fact that you're looking at being tough on crime is good, but at least other problems. Strongly agree or disagree? Oh, I think to a point we agree. I mean, we disagree. You disagree yeah, because? Yeah. Well, I think that that just sets up everyone who uh, is enforcing is, is, is going to be hard on, on uh, and you're bad you get eventually you get to the idea who's bad and who's good you know mm -hmm. who makes that determination well I think that was part of the disagreement the, okay. well, yeah, that was, was but one of them would be certainly the person who is in charge of enforcing that law the person, the so you disagree because the person in charge of enforcing the law well, is making the determination on who's bad and who's good? Uh, yeah, I didn't tell you. I didn't think we got I didn't think we were You were still working well. through <laughs> that, you know, that, but, That's but, the one we talked about most. Okay. I, and you five. But it's, everything's black and white, I guess. And, and I say that in the sense it's either good or bad. And it's not. But it's, it's, yeah. it's not uh -huh. true. I mean, that's the but way we not, look at everything right. in duality, but that's not, it shouldn't be the way we look at it. Well, and that's what, that's, that's why you're in this. That's, that's, that's why, why we want it talked about, because that's, that's what And that's why it's to, on there. Why it because it should lead to further conversation yeah. that we have. Yeah. <laughs> right? It should lead to further conversation if someone brings that view. And that's the thought behind this. Like, we're all bringing our experiences, right? We're all bringing our viewpoints to the table, and we look at these views, and we're either strongly agreeing or strongly disagreeing because of, of something that has to do with our lived experiences. This is why I can say this about this view. So it, it is going to lead, it should lead to further conversation that we need to have continuously. Otherwise, we're going to stay with our views, and we're going to consider things black and white and we're gonna treat people accordingly. We're gonna be making decisions about who's good and who's bad. We're not being culturally competent or responsive or respectful. We're not realizing that we're acting in bias. So there's all kinds of things that are in play that should lead to further conversation. I guess that's why it kind of came out of our table was we had a few one, a few three, a few four, two people. That was the strongest consensus there. And a five and, a, and an eight. And there's five of us here. So that was six views. Um, <laughs> so because everyone's bringing a different perspective. Because, exactly. And um, so we didn't have any real super, and to me, that's what it says. I mean, here we are, exactly, every single one of us with a different perspective because of our own different experiences. Mm -hmm. Or watching or observing someone else's or whatever. So. Yes. The other thing Not surprising. Too. One second, real quick. Okay. We're going to come back. Yeah, I wanted to skip backwards. I know we're on five, but we didn't really talk about four. So oh, four yeah. is one that Arthur yeah. talked about. Yes. Um, and just kind of putting this idea out around the nature of community policing is that there is a community aspect to it. Um, and so, what are the ways in which we are equipping communities to be their own first line of defense? Uh, what are the ways that we're equipping folks in neighborhoods to be able to defuse situations before the police are called? Uh, what are the ways in which uh, we equip and train folks 
uh, to be able to do some of this preliminary stuff. So a 10 hour shift can maybe be an eight or nine hour shift. Um, and as we, as we think about community policing, I think we need to be really smart about um, not just the ways we're teaching the community to engage with the police and the policies that are set up in that, uh, but what are the ways that we're actually getting people in the community uh, to deal with one another? Uh, what are the needs that aren't being met that are leading uh, to crime or whatever it is that we're seeing in communities? Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. And as she finishes really speaking, I want everyone to just be conscious and aware that's why we need a good eight to 10 hours to have this conversation over several days. Um, because that's, that's so important, all the things that were, um, that she spoke about is getting to know one another, getting to know the needs of the community, getting to understand why this, this area has high, high crime, so it's being perceived as the worst neighborhood, why they're being policed in this way, like all the things that we need to be having to realize that all of them have impact on the other. So it does lead to a broader conversation. So we're gonna remix in, in just a minute. I wanna go straight to what Reverend Molly asked before we got started. And what about the views that are not represented? Because in the first one, we already kind of hit on um, what we, we what views are closest to our own and what views we didn't really like, which is round two that you don't really agree with. Kind of covered it. So we're gonna spend more time in this next round on three, which is really two. What other views would you add? So going through this list and thinking about what are the views that we really need to talk about that are important and specific to our community, that are important and specific to the relationships between police and community here in Columbia. So we're gonna spend more time on having this conversation and then report out. Can we do that? Are you flexible enough to remix a little bit? Or are we rigid? Because I can go back to, uh, <laughs> how are we feeling? Good. Temperature, yeah. pulse, everybody? Yeah. So let's talk about the views that you've gone through as a group and you've seen these different perspectives that we provided for you. They may or might not have been your own. You did find some that you found commonalities with that were closest to you. You did find some that you absolutely did not agree with. What are the views that are missing? So spend some time in silent reflection. And then we're gonna to work together. And that's not fair. Yeah, it raises anxiety and it also creates a false sense of what, you know, each 30 seconds. Wrap up your final thoughts and your table. Choose your color. Oh, but then you all turn around. So we can go ahead and get started. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, who would like to share first? Ooh, Molly. And she is ambitious about it, so we're going to the back first. Um, I think the table had shared enthusiasm about this view. Some of us, anyway, I won't speak the whole table. Um, I would like to share the view that evidence of communication of racist sentiment should be a fireable offense because we'll never get to doing anything about the implicit bias if we create a culture that allows for explicit bias. And I also have the view that we need to reimagine entirely how we create safe communities. So a couple of things in there. If, if you would, maybe you can one of those over here um, and talk about that. All right. Did every, does anyone need clarity and understanding on what was just shared and the view that we need to discuss. It was pretty straightforward. Okay. Pretty clear. Wrong. Clear. Wrong. No. <laughs> no, but if we feel that way, this is where we're talking about those things. So, what do you feel? Were you just joking? Um, slightly, but uh, well, when you said, "Who's going to define explicit action?" that would become fired, you know, lead to someone being fired. Uh, and, you know, that's where you, it's hard to define a lot of these things, but that would have to be defined uh, more more clearly, I think, before you could say, hey. We would fired. definitely need to put some parameters yes. around it, but the conversation, the view to be discussed was, this is what the community wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, if this is displayed, this is what we want to see. And so I think that's a view that many share and it should be talked about. 
right. that's where I usually am. I even want to push back a little bit on that. I think in the context of what Molly was talking about, was talking specifically about the nature of racism, and like explicit racism feels pretty clear to me. I think that's a thing as a community that we all have a pretty clear understanding around. Absolutely. And I think just to go back to what I shared earlier, um, and if you haven't seen this video, I encourage you to go and watch it. But it's Jay Smooth, how to tell someone and it's smooth like peanut butter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you look up Jay Smooth, and he has a video. It was probably like 12 or 13 years ago. He had hair back then. Yeah. Um, and he talks about how to tell someone that they sound racist, or that they are racist. No, that they sound racist. They sound racist. He says you don't tell someone that they're racist. Yes. And it's not because you might be wrong. It's because you might be right. And then they start to derail the conversations about, but I'm an outstanding guy, I have like two black friends, and, you know, and then we start going into all of the reasons why they're not a racist, and it derails the conversation. So now we're focusing on this person trying to disprove that this is not what they are. So remember, we don't focus on who we think they are, we focus on what they did. So if you explicitly did this, then that's what we're focusing on, and we're holding you accountable for what you did. Not for who we think you are. That's not important. And he gives the example of somebody stole his wallet. He's not going to run down the street to be like, I think that you're a thief. Who cares who they think they are? But we are going to focus on the fact that you stole my wallet. So let's say that you can call yourself what you want, but the action that we're holding you accountable for is stealing my wallet. Right? So it was, I'm telling you, it was transformative for me, even in the work that I do in familial relationships, like everywhere, to help people understand we have to hold each other accountable for actions. So that's what we're doing. So the conversation, the view that we want to put on, um, that this table would like to, to add is, if explicit racism is shown, they want it to be a fireable offense. Further discussion is definitely warranted, right? But that's the view. What other views did tables add? Well, I'm just speaking for myself, that I think we need to hold businesses more responsible for the things that happen in our community. For example, uh, a, lot of, a lot of police officers have to go downtown between midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning because there are so many intoxicated people downtown. Well, those people are intoxicated because the businesses have allowed them to get that intoxicated and have profited from those people getting intoxicated. And so police officers that might be someplace else in town, be needed someplace else in town, get funneled down there to deal with those kind of issues. And so I think it's businesses that are making money off selling alcohol, selling guns, and individuals making money off of selling drugs. There are a lot of things where businesses should be held accountable and our politicians should hold those businesses accountable through uh, more appropriate legislation. Okay, did you get that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Over here. I wanna, we talked a lot about view four, which we talked about the first round. And, okay. And I wanna uh, add to the second view that this table added about completely re-envisioning safe communities. Um, we talked about community policing means community as well as policing. And we have to think about how the community takes responsibility in, in the ways that these other tables are talking about. Okay. So reimagine um, safe neighborhoods. What, what, that was it, right? Mm -hmm. What and we're defining as. Just reimagining what is a safe community. In what general, is a safe and community? And how do we make that? How do we foster that as a community? Before so, yeah. we call the police. Before we call so the to police. be even more specific, how are we reimagining the nature of policing and like the system in which policing exists? Well, that's a, an eight to 10 to 12 hour conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. But I think that draws a big point when you just said it. It's a 10 to 12 hour conversation. We're going to walk away tonight with probably a lot of realizations and understanding maybe some hard, hard feelings or hard things to digest, but like, we're not going to walk away with all the answers. Right. So conversations like this have to continue right. to happen. It can't be something that happens once. It's not a one-time event. And right. then we meet again next year around the same time and then call it a good time. Yeah, we don't do that. So that's kind of how I take um, my view on diversity. So so many times we go to a diversity event or a diversity training in class and we check that off the list and we're good for at least a year, right? 
Um, so we can't we can't think of it like that. If we're talking about real and intentional change, this can't be a one-time event. There's nothing we could even in our first uh, go round, the first round, we already realized like we don't have enough time to discuss this stuff. Like we need more time to have these conversations. And I think that just speaks to where we m go moving forward is we need more time to have have these conversations. So we're reimagining um, safe neighborhoods and what that means, a safe community overall. Because different things, different perspectives are gonna come. Well, safety to me means I'm able to leave my doors unlocked. Safety to me, I, no, we're not doing that. I saw your family like, no, no we're not doing that. <laughs> um, safety to me means um, there's only people in my neighborhood who look like me. That's gonna be a view. Safety to me means. Nobody that's not bald. No bald, no bald. No, not bald. No, not bald people. Yeah. Only bald people. Okay. All right. <laughs> so that's going to mean different things to different people. So to their point, it's a broader conversation that needs to take place. It's an uncomfortable conversation because somebody's views are going to be challenged because people are diff bringing different perspectives to the table, and some of us are operating through bias lenses because we haven't done the work necessary to uncover um, those biases. Some biases are explicit, let me be clear. But those implicit ones that we don't even think about, that drive why we do, why we say, how we act, where we go, who we are in community with, who we are in relationship with, we don't even think about that. Though That's where we need to spend some time. Uh, we had two, I think. So I was unable to stay, but he brought up the fact that how do we get the entire community to understand what we mean by community policing. So people in the fifth ward don't have the same problems that the people in the first and the third. Why is the city <coughs> only focusing on three areas instead of helping the rest of the community understand why community policing is needed? People may not even understand that there's problems happening. I mean, it, it's hard right now to not hear it in the news, but I mean, they're safe in their neighborhoods, like you said, you know? They live in a place where everybody looks like them and everything's good. So we need this broader understanding across the entire city of why we're doing this and what the conversation is. And then we also had a point of um, understanding the people with disabilities, and that's the point of view that we felt was kind of missing from this conversation. Family members who maybe have people with mental illness or autism on the spectrum. Um, how do we help community and police understand the needs when police are called during a situation? Absolutely. Did everyone catch that, especially with May being Mental Health Awareness Month? Um, just bringing up, you know, mental illness um, is definitely something that needs to be discussed and it's very important in this policing conversation um, because it's a population, it's a community that is severely disenfranchised. Um, and treated differently because of, and there, Asha, we have to demystify um, mental health in and of itself. But that's another broader conversation, and how do we de-escalate? How do we handle? Um, when do you have to use for, you know, it's, it's a broader conversation, but absolutely, the mental health aspect. May I segue on that? I know you hit your hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the hand over here. This was uh, something we were discussing about. The police <clears throat> are asked to do all kinds of jobs that are really outside their expertise, and in, in, especially in relation to folks who have mental problems and handling those. Um, you know, they're there to enforce the law and, and, and keep the community safe, Absolutely. but uh, they're asked to wear all kinds of hats. And, uh, and with that, we said there needs to be, and this has been discussed before, some way of having a more central control over social services to get these folks the help they need rather than them just being taken to the police station and arrested. And I, I know that's been discussed before and I don't know how far that's moved along, but uh, I don't think we have that coordination going on in the city. Um, <coughs> so they need more access to uh, services for people with problems. Absolutely, access to care is huge. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. 
Um, so we had a very rich discussion on the importance of communication in the community and the need to rebuild a sense of community. Um, going back to police are a part of the community and our strength derives from our community. So that's um, one of the main points we had is we need to start rebuilding that community and it may take a long time to rebuild. Um, we need to figure out why people have lost that willingness to participate. And go from there. Community lost the willingness to participate in like conversations like these. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but just in protecting Absolutely. their own neighborhoods. Yeah. Absolutely. Or even getting to know one another, just saying hi to, to your neighbor. Absolutely. Even came up. Thank you for that. Can I even just interject for just a moment? So you mentioned, Ashley, that our police are part of their, our community, which we do all understand that, right? They're humans first. Um, human first that have taken on this role, um, at taking, on, taking on this career. So when I think about the different viewpoints and understanding that we're all bringing our own perspectives to the table, a lot of times we're not used to having conversations like this. Because how often do you sit and say, well, let me first think about it from their point of view before you interject your own? Or do you dismiss your own feelings and say, well, wait, first let me consider their viewpoint. We're not used to doing that often. But when we think about you know, the many hats that we're asking our officers to wear, and I'm going to flip it and talk about community as well, but would, it, would you think about things differently, understanding our police officers are humans first, they're working. 10 hour shifts, they're, um, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, there's less than 70 or approximately 70% of them are five years in the force or less. Um, they're extremely fatigued, you know, they're out, they're trying to be downtown and then all the way across town as well when the call comes in. They're going to do disaster relief on top of the, the resource, what they're doing here in our own community, and you know that happened recently. Um, maybe if we think about them human first, personally, maybe they're going through, um, they have a sick child at home, maybe they have, are going through a divorce, like would we think about what they have to do and what they're going through differently if we just thought for a second about their viewpoint? But do we do that? Or is it easier to say, well look, I need my officer here, I need it there, they just need to be doing this, but do we ever consider, like, how can we develop the relationship to just get an understanding first? Because there has to be a level of frustration. <clears throat> but then from the citizen's perspective, because we have to consider the viewpoint officers of the citizens as well. I was pulled over the other day. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, immediately, it was broad daylight, it was Memorial Day. The officer I'd never seen him before. He was definitely young. He was cute too, but anyway. That's, not, that's, 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 another, that's another thing. Yeah. He didn't mind. I didn't mind. But when I think about it, I have my daughters in the car. We had just left Kinko's. We were downtown. We were, I was commenting to my daughters about this cute baby blue Jeep that was throwing mail in. We were listening to the new get up song. And I was like, when we get to grandma's, we're gonna practice this dance. And like, we're just having a good time, but apparently I rolled the stop, stop sign. Mm. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Shame on you. Yeah. <laughs> apparently I rolled the stop sign. But you know, I'm a citizen. I was pulled over and immediately I was scared. It's broad daylight, but I don't get to shed this skin. I don't get to, um, just erase everything that I see in the media. I don't get to be, um, I don't get to just dismiss all the stories that I've heard from family members. I don't get all of that. I immediately was scared. I have insurance, everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, my car is mine. I need a new one, but anyway, it's mine. <laughs> you know, so I had nothing to be scared of, but was. So do our police officers think? So we always have to think about somebody else's viewpoint. Now let me, ma'am, let me say that he handled it so well. I can't even remember his name. Cause I was like, hi, I, you, I did what? Like I didn't even, it was a blur. But he handled it so professionally, 
but I was ready for him not to, and that was scary. And I'm telling my girls, sit down, don't say anything. He came on the passenger side um, and handled it well, but initially there was fear. So do our police, so when we think about our citizens and what's going on nationally that you don't have time to think about but have to, like there's a, there's a perception of who you are in this role. Even when you're good people just doing your job, you still have this, this negative connotation we can't, we are working hard in our community to shed. So we always have, I say all that and share that story to, share, to say, we have to consider the different viewpoints and we can do that better if we're in conversation and working toward relationship with one another. When we're not operating in crisis when we're only bringing our perspective to the table and refusing to hear anyone else's. We have to realize that we're all humans first, and we all have biases, and we all can't deny that. And even when you put the uniform on, and even when we get dressed in the mornings, nothing that we're, our, our badges, none of that excludes us or, or um, exempts us from having these biases if we aren't intentional about understanding what they are and doing what we need to do to mitigate them. There's so many different things into play but are necessary if we're going to be um, moving forward to the change we want to see. We have to consider everyone else. These conversations can't be one-offs. They just can't. So I think that's kind of the goal of community-oriented policing. Mm -hmm. It's not only for the community to understand that the police are human and make mistakes and are working long hours and are mm -hmm. underpaid, and et cetera, et cetera. It's yeah. also for police officers, when they're pulling a citizen over, to understand that, yes, there are objective facts that they did something wrong, mm -hmm. but what are the outside factors that are contributing to why this person did the thing that they did? Uh, are there other factors that need to be considered or should we just you know, throw the book at them because they objectively did something wrong? And one of the things that I, I heard one of the officers say one time is that when they're looking at a case, they're only looking at the objective facts. And that means that they're also not understanding their own biases mm -hmm. because they believe that they are objective. And they might not be because they're not con considering what sort of biases they have, that sometimes it's not objective facts it's it's very situational information so it, it's to build trust to have both the police and the community view each other as humans and allow them to make mistakes and to correct mistakes because people learn and grow when they can correct the mistakes that they've made if we don't ever give them a chance to do that then they're never going to learn There was a hand in the back for a while. First, I want to say I agree with like everything that everybody is saying. Um, but I've been a teacher for a really long time, um, and I have seen so many of my students and families in, in the neighborhood where I live. People are arrested and, and pulled over, and, and we know from reading the news that over was it seventy five percent or seventy percent of the pullovers are for people of color. So I guess the question that I have for you and everyone here is every time I come to these meetings, I get so excited and I'm here and I'm happy, but I get upset because I feel like there's no sense of urgency to fix this inequity. And this inequity and these mistakes, if we're going to call them that, because I wouldn't call them that. I wasn't there. And I would never say a police officer made a mistake like that. That, that I think, is the thing that you were talking about earlier. But those things directly impact people. Yeah. These are people being pulled over. These are people being arrested. These biases that we have directly impact people's lives. There are people that go to prison and jail and have to pay or miss work because they got pulled over for something. So what I'm trying to say is that it's easy for us to sit here in this conversation and eat cookies and carrots and say, oh, we're working on community policing. But I guess I want to ask, like, let's figure out how to address the immediate problem as well because the people who are immediately affected by it may not be here but it's affecting them every day in their lives in their work their children in school the the feelings that they have about the police about our community 
And I can tell you from my perspective, I have a great friend. He's an African American guy, a lot of you are African, and a lot of you probably know him. Um, every time I pick him up in my car, I will tell you 50% of the time, we end up getting tailed by a police officer. And I'm not being negative towards those police. I'm just saying that for some of you guys, I'm looking at this room and I'm saying that like, this problem doesn't exist the same way for all of us. And I just think that that is something that needs to be talked about or at least stated here today. Thank you. So yeah, um, one thing I wanna say is we do have to create some action behind it. And a lot of the time when you see people missing in the room and um, I can think back to working closely with Carolyn a couple of, of years ago, and it is pressing to try to find people, hi Sophia, um, that are in the room to have these difficult conversations in the strategic neighborhoods that were mentioned. And a lot of that, um, and I can speak as a member of this community and understanding the conversations that I've had with different individuals, there's just a certain amount of fatigue. Of, I'm tired of trying to get people to see me as a human first to look back before you categorize me and, and make assumptions about who I am, there's a certain amount of fatigue that um, causes people to be missing from spaces like this. So the, the question is, still remains like, what can we do um, to move things forward and to get those communities that are impacted the greatest back to, I think there was even like, how do we get them back in the room or are hopeful or are ready to have these conversations again? And I'll tell you what, how? is it can't just be conversation. We can do this and it does feel good for the moment, but until um, community members see that our leadership is intentional about the change that we're talking about, it's going to be the same. And so yeah, next year we'll be having the same conversations <laughs> and people are tired and they'll start to just, just drop from the room and not show up. So we can still talk about views, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about before leaving is where do we go from here? And initially when I posed this question, it was what is the best thing that we can do, to we collectively, do to strengthen relationships between community and law enforcement? But it's changed up on this slide for a reason, because it has to start individually first. What can I do? You have to acknowledge the personal work that each and every one of us have to do. None of us are exempt. None of us. So what can I do personally um, to do that work? Finding out what my biases are, recognizing that I have them, and no position of power um, or anything, no role that I have in the community, no matter who I know and how I know them, is going to exempt me from the personal work that I have to do. I have to deal with that myself. Um, in when I was preparing to do this role full time. And can I just tell you, it's not comfortable at all. And that's okay. But it's not comfortable when you're being critiqued on the job that you think you're doing well. It's not. It's not comfortable to hear um, those areas of, of opportunity <laughs> that I have, those areas for development in which I need to grow. It's not comfortable for me to hear, like Nikki, like, you, mm, no, you, you're not doing good here, and maybe you need to do this. But it's necessary. If we're able to develop the relationships, then we can have those conversations where we hold each other accountable, and they're better received. But we have to do the individual work first. So recognizing that we have biases and doing the work to mitigate them. Getting to know each other. This is the thing, like, I've been, it's been offered to me several times to do ride-alongs. And I've come up with every excuse not to do the ride-along. I'm just gonna be completely transparent. But it has been offered. So if our officers are saying, spend some time with me, maybe not that whole 10 hours, but <laughs> no. a couple of them, no, no, no 10. right? No. Uh, a couple of hours and bring the snacks. You know, just come yeah. and ride along and see what it's like. Now I did it, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Issues. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote with Jeff. And Completely true. He went like this, and I went. That's a shaky. True story. <laughs> the biggest wimp there is. <laughs> but our officers are willing to allow our community to see, to take a ride um, with them, to just get an idea of what the job entails. 
It is so easy to critique other people. It's so, I can do it well. I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. To tell other people what they're doing wrong. And it's difficult to point at ourselves and figure that out for us individually. Like, self-reflective. Yes? My challenge would be, would be that we all take that Harvard implicit bias oh. test and meet back in a month. Oh, okay. That's very, I don't think you're the one that needs to take it. No, 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 no. I don't I'm think, gonna push back I don't think we're not, okay, we're not the only one who needs to Okay, exactly. Because we yeah. need to look at why the, there's not more community involved. In mm -hmm. We all have a responsibility in this relationship. Relationships can't go, we're talking about successful relationships, not dysfunctional. Because you can keep the dysfunctional relationship. I'm all about peace and prosperity at this point in my life. But they exist. Right? But we have to realize that we all have collective responsibility in this work. So it's not just about pointing the finger, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, and you're not doing this for me, you're not doing that. We all have responsibility in this. But we do have to develop the relationship where we can hold each other accountable. We have to. Be like, so officer, um, Jergens, mm. we need to talk about that. We need to talk about that post because you're in the public eye. We're depending on you. Like I need to be able to rely on you for my um, safety. I need to know that you're going to protect me too. But when you make posts like that, even if that's how you feel, not everybody needs to see that. Those are things that we can talk about in private. Buy me some coffee, then we can talk. I do breakfasts, breakfast <laughs> too. Cafe Berlin. <laughs> so get to know each other on both sides. Address the uncomfortable issues head on. So can I just say, if it's about race, can we just talk about race? If it's about social economic class, can we just talk about that? We have to get to a point where we're not trying to go through the back door to talk about issues when it's right in front of, it, of us what it's about. We have to get to the place where we can just talk about the issues that exist. Understanding full well that you're going to have a different perspective than me, maybe, because you've had a different lived experience. You can't tell me, Jeff, what it's like to be a black woman, nor can you. I don't think so. Okay, no. <laughs> I got that, though. I can tell you my lived experience. And then you can tell me yours. And we can learn from each other. But we have to put ourselves in a position to do that and address those uncomfortable issues head on, especially when there are barriers to our moving forward successfully. And let's find outlets other than social media to express our emotions. <laughs> Can <Amen>. we? <laughs> because it's not because we don't all have freedom of speech. We do. But to whom much is given, much is required. And we have to realize in an already fractured relationship, anything done in that light is going to cause more dysfunction, more distress, more animosity, more unwillingness to come together, more unwillingness to work together. And even though it was, it was Joe Jurgens, Joe Jurgens is now being seen as a representative of an entire force that didn't even know that Joe said this. But now, community members are looking at each and every officer they see through the lens of Jeff, of Joe, not Jeff, <clears throat> Joe Jergens. <laughs> Joe Jergens. Okay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. Sometimes I have to take frequent social media breaks. Like, my mind is not in a place because what's going on nationally, it might even be anything with me personally, but I'm seeing too much news nationally that is impacting my spirit and psyche. So I can't function effectively, especially in a role like the one that you have, that I have, where I'm talking to, to people about biases and prejudice and all the isms and um, everything. It's a lot of weight to carry. So sometimes we just have to find other outlets. It's necessary. But what is the best thing we can do individually to strengthen the relationship. That's what I hope we leave here this evening thinking about. And I don't know what the next step is. I talk about the Harvard Implicit Association test all the time. It's the vein in which I live, talking about these things. I love it. Um, so we can, definitely. 
have conversations, but you can also join the journey toward inclusive excellence where we do a lot of these things free and open to the public. Shameless plug. <laughs> so I have some homework, not even homework. If we could spend the next 10 minutes or right before you leave just going through these reflections and leave these here. Now the first sheet you didn't have to, we didn't need you to leave. This sheet I do want you to leave if you can. But I want you to think about the hope you have for the future of our community. I want you to think about the hope that you have about the police in our community. I want you to consider what we're up against and trying our best to work together. And we're going to collect these. We're going to meet with our city leadership. And can I one more time just um, pay respects to the officers in the room? Thank you, because they did not have to be here. of this conversation um, and I believe in great leadership so these two gentlemen have interim in front of their names but mm, I don't know what kind of impact we get to have but interim chief Jeff Jones thank you for being in the room um, and our interim city manager John so thank you so much for being in the room so if you could just spend some time going through this information I greatly appreciate it Thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your Thursday evening.